We now continue our sermon series, Questions Jesus Asked. Some attribute perhaps as many as 300 or more questions to Jesus. We've been seeing that questions are an important teaching and preaching tool that Jesus was a masterful user of. Questions, we see, draw the listener into an active participation as they consider themselves, even today, part of the narrative. Yes, questions can move people from bystanders to disciples. Jesus' first recorded words in Scripture as a 12-year-old to his parents come to us as a question. What are you looking? Why are you looking for me? He calmed the sea and questioned the disciples' faith in a boat with, Why are you afraid? Don't you have any faith? Jesus now begins his mission, his public ministry, and calls disciples to partner with him. He is teaching in their meeting places, the synagogues, along the seashore, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. He's also active out in the villages and countryside. And a report about him went abroad, and great crowds, we're told, gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. Jesus, his reputation is preceding him. The stories of his healings draws a crowd here in Capernaum, quickly filling the home. Now some of the details are left out in our reading today from Luke, but we find it filled in by Mark. And it's Mark that places the story in Capernaum, likely at Peter's house. This house, it is full. Friends, followers, neighbors, and strangers have all made their way to the inside. There are also the religious elitists, unable to ignore the crowds that Jesus is drawing there to investigate. It is their job, their right, their authority to prevent false teachers from leading people astray, and they've made their way to the center of the room. Now, not all were able to make it in time to get a good view. There he lays. His disability keeps him on the outside. This is always the case. He cannot contribute to his family. To society, he is pushed to the margins and kept far away from the center of life. He's tried it all. He even appealed to the religious leaders for help. But they couldn't or wouldn't heal him. They wouldn't even give him any attention. They called him dirty, broken, an undeserving sinner. They said he was the way he was because God was angry with him. And who are they to stand in the way of God's punishment? He knows that they despise him. They won't even acknowledge him as he begs in the marketplace, sinner. Some religious leaders, they are, they're hypocrites. As he tries to comfort himself in his own defensiveness. But deep down, their judgment hurts. Maybe God has abandoned him. Maybe he isn't good for anything. He had heard news of a miracle worker and how crowds from all over the region were gathering, gathering around and being healed. He heard that this miracle worker was going to be nearby, but how would someone like him even get close? He would never be able to get to Jesus, not an outsider like himself. 
Yet he has something that not everyone in his position has. A blessing. This man has friends. And his friends were deeply concerned. They knew he didn't deserve to be left out. To be left like this. They thought they'd be early. But even as early as they came, they were too late and couldn't even get through the door. A crowd had already made their way inside to see Jesus. The text is Luke chapter 5, beginning with the 17th verse. On one of those days, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you, or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, Pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A broken man is brought to Jesus by his friends. He's paralyzed, unable to walk, unable to work, to contribute to society. He's an outcast, looked down upon by the leaders of the community. God is a just God, is he not? This man must deserve punishment. He must be a sinner. He knows that they despise him. They won't even acknowledge him as he begs in the marketplace. Maybe God has abandoned him. But Jesus changes that. This broken man pushed to the outside of society, is pulled into the middle of what God is doing. Son, your sins are forgiven. God sees you. God loves you. You are worthy. Good news. Liberty. Wholeness. You are favored, in fact, by God. And it begins... The looks, the whispers, the murmuring, the holy huddle, the indignation. You'll notice that there is no, how dare these men tear through the roof. There is no, how dare this crippled man make such a commotion. There is only, how dare Jesus pronounce forgiveness in the name of God. Which is easier, to go on with the same small, narrow, limited view of God, 
and be comfortable? Or to let God show you a new life of freedom and wholeness, but you'd have to admit that you've been wrong and that you're broken. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, rise and walk? Are, are you telling me what I can't do? Are you telling me what God can't do? Certainly words are one thing. So let me show you what I can do. What God can do through me. And that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Rise. Pick up your bed and go home. What Jesus does here is reverse the polarity. Those that think themselves as insiders are sent to the outside. And those considered outsiders are brought into the center. The haughty critics pull away by their own hardened hearts. The humble and meek are drawn in by their faith. Which is easier, Jesus asks. On the surface, of course, it is easier to say the words, your sins are forgiven, because that's something invisible, impossible to disprove. It does seem harder to say, take up your bed and walk, because if the man does not get up, then the one who said the words will be shown to have no authority. But on a deeper level, it is harder to forgive sins because only God can forgive sins at the cost of Christ's death on the cross. So, since Jesus can do the visible miracle and heal the man, this is the evidence that he also has the power to do the invisible miracle, to forgive sins. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's the question on their heart that Jesus perceives. And he answers that question with, yes. Yes, I have the authority, the authority from God because I have come from God and I am God. Which is easier, to go on with the same small, narrow, limited view of God and be comfortable? Or let God show you a new life of freedom and wholeness? But you have to admit that you're broken. He came into the room through the roof, lowered down by four friends on a mat. He came into the room broken, paralyzed, unable to move or walk. He left the room through the front door, forgiven and healed his friend's radical compassion, his own faith, and of course, the power of Christ changed the man's life. He's restored to a life of inclusion and participation that at first his disability prevented. And he is restored in the spirit to a life of inclusion and participation in God's realm. They came into the room through the front door, blocking entry to those who had true faith. Their vain hypocrisy, their sneers and snickers, their holy huddle and whispers reveals their true brokenness. They left the room with righteous indignation, unable to be moved to be changed, to be forgiven and freed. 
To them, there was too much to lose and let go of. Which is easier? To go on with the same small, narrow, limited view of God and be comfortable? Or let God show you a new life of freedom and wholeness, but you have to admit that you're broken? Just who are the sinners in the story? Just who needs forgiveness? Who is it that needs healing? Which is easier? For Jesus, the question is a mute one. For Jesus, forgiveness and healing are each easily accomplished. He not only has the ability and power to forgive and heal, he has the willingness, the desire. In fact, Jesus' mission, his assignment is to bring close the kingdom of God. To bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who were bound, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to bring us the abundant mercy and grace that flows from the throne of God. Jesus, Jesus comes to those in need. Can we admit that we are in need? Will we recognize it? Can we acknowledge our own brokenness, our own need, knowing that Jesus welcomes the sinner, the outcast, the broken, and forgives, restores, and heals? If Jesus could do that for them, which is easier? To hold on to your broken life? To stay unchanged, unmoved, bound up and enslaved? Or admit that you're broken and let God show you a new new life? a life of freedom, a life of wholeness. Which is easier? There's nothing. There's nothing you even have to do that's already been done for you. All you have to do is let go, ask, receive, Be forgiven, be freed. Let us pray. Gracious God, you come to us in Jesus Christ offering restoration, offering reconciliation, offering us a love like a love we've never experienced anywhere else. You offer us, O God, a freedom from our small-mindedness. You offer us liberation from all that imprisons us. You offer us freedom from that which drags us down, overburdens us, wears us out, You offer to free us from our sin, from our guilt, from our pride, our vanity. You offer us a freedom that is defined by your love for us. A love which keeps loving. May we we embrace that which is easier, a life freed rather than a life burdened, a life given to you, given by you to us to enjoy, to embrace, and to share. 
for these and all your blessings, O God. We pray with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nope, don't worry. It is at this table that we can...